All right, well, good morning once again. Uh, we're joined together for our pastor's Bible study. And I tried to record these on Monday, and I didn't get to it yesterday, and I apologize for that. Um, but we're going to jump back into the Word of God today. Uh, and we're continuing in this study. You remember, based on this book, we started the study last week. This book by a man named Dr. Wayne Grudem. And the book is called 20 Basics Every Christian Should Know. And we're not going to go page by page through it, but we're kind of using that as the template or the basis of the things that we're studying. And we, you know, we talked about why it's important for us to know. We're doing this because I want us to know as believers, not just what we believe, but why we believe it. That's important for us. Think about some of the things that you believe about your Christian faith. And if someone were to ask you, why do you believe what you believe about Jesus? Why do you believe what, do you, what you believe about God or what you believe about the Bible? Could you explain to them, take them to the Scripture and say, this is what I believe and why? Many times I, we, we have picked up things that we believe, not core doctrines of the faith necessarily, but things we have believed about theological issues, we pick them up from places other than the Bible. Maybe sometimes we, we pick some things up because that's what our mother taught us as we were growing up. Or we pick some things up from, from Christian music, or we pick some things up from my favorite pastor said this. But we couldn't go back to the Word of God and point out why we believe what we believe. There's something I think that's, that's a little bit amusing to me um, that happens in Acts chapter 17. On Sunday mornings, we're, we're going through the book of 1 Thessalonians. And as, as Paul was on his second missionary journey, he visited the city of Thessalonica. And when he got there in Acts chapter 17, uh, there was trouble. And some of the folks that were causing trouble for Paul before followed him to Thessalonica. And so the, the people there, the church there, they, they whisked Paul and Silas off and they went on to a town called Berea. And this is what Paul found. He found something remarkable about the Bereans when he went there. This is what he had to say, Acts chapter 17, verse 11. And by the way, as we're doing this, as I mentioned last week, bring your Bible when we come to these sessions because we're going to be bouncing around in Scripture. We're going to look at a lot of Scriptures, and I want you to look at Scripture as I'm telling you these things. And this is why. This is what Paul found when he got to Berea. This is what he said about them. He said, Now these Bereans were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the Scriptures daily to see whether these things weren't so. And it's kind of amusing to think that as Paul preached there, after the synagogue service, after the service, they all went home and they opened up the scripture. And they said, this is what Paul said. Let me go and check that out. And I don't think necessarily they disbelieved Paul. But I think there was something that was admirable about that and that they opened up the word and they said, we want to know what Paul said about Jesus was this and I want to see that. I want to learn that. I want to know what it is we believe and why we believe it. And there in Acts chapter 17, it's an encouragement. And he says, this is good. I'm glad they did this. He holds this up as an example. But we fast forward into Paul's ministry and Paul's life, and we get to 2 Timothy, for example. The very last thing that Paul wrote, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 and if you have children in Awana, or you grew up in Awana, this verse, you know it. You, you've memorized it. Because 2 Timothy 2.15 is the Awana key verse, and this is what he says to Timothy. He says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that doesn't need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now here's the thing. In Acts chapter 17, it's an encouragement. Man, that was great. They dug in. They looked at the Word of God <clears throat> to know what they believed and why they believed it. Second Timothy, it's a command. Study. 
Show yourself approved unto God. Don't be ashamed. Be able to rightly divide the word of truth. That's why we're doing this. I want us to know as a community of faith why we believe what we believe. So now we started last week with the study of what is God like. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna re-go over all of that. Uh, when we talk about what God is like, we, we covered some things. I will hit just, just the, the big muscle movements. We talked about the fact that God exists. We, we recognize that not because there is 100% ironclad proof in Scripture. Because the Bible doesn't, you remember, doesn't even attempt to prove that God exists. Simply, matter-of-factly, assumes it. But that's important for us to know that God does exist. That's something significant about him. And we learn a great deal about God from Scripture just assuming, first of all, that he does exist. And, and we talked about some of those things. The, psalm, the psalmist, Psalm chapter 14, verse 1, he said, The fool says in his heart there is no God. And one of the reasons that's so very foolish, foolish is, first of all, it's just like an ostrich sticking his head in the sand, ignoring the reality of, of what I see and experience around me, what, my, what everything within my being tells me must be so. But you remember we looked at the, the importance of recognizing God exists because it answers questions like, where did we come from? One of the key questions bantered around in schools today, evolution versus creationism. Where did we come from? Who are we? Why are we here? Man, that's a question that has plagued mankind for thousands, hundreds of thousands of years even. Why are we on this planet? What should we be doing? How should we be living? Where are we going? What's after all of this? A lot of me affirming God's existence means that our lives have meaning and purpose. Remember, we looked at that. We also looked at the fact that God is knowable. We can know some things about God, not everything. And that's also significant. And you remember, I used the example of a dog and how, though we love our dogs and we have some semblance of a relationship with our dogs, they, they we just operate on a different level. Our dogs can't really comprehend and understand us. They can know some things about us, but not everything. And it is that way with God. He is so far above us that we can know what we need to know, just not everything we might want to know. But you know, that's, a, that's an important truth about the Bible. There are many times when we open up the pages of Scripture and we long to know more God, I wish you would tell me more about why you did this or, or why this was so or why this wasn't so. But we have to come to the recognition and say the Bible doesn't tell us always everything we want to know, but it does tell us everything we need to know. And we cannot know everything about God, but we can know what we need to know about Him. And I want to pick up, pick up there because that's kind of where we ended last time. And, and one of the things that we can know about God is that he is personal, and he is personally knowable. I mentioned that on Sunday in, in the message out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 11 through 13. If you didn't see that, go back on our YouTube channel and check it out. But that God is an intensely personal God, and we see that through the pages of Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament. He is personally knowable. But thinking about that example, that illustration of a dog or a cat, you know, the, our dog, a dog and a cat, they can't know us. They can't examine us. We have abilities and, and um, the opportunity, and we have um, some, some things that we can do that dogs and cats simply can't do. You and I can ask questions, and we can investigate things, and, and we can evaluate the answers that we're finding and draw conclusions from it. We have abilities they simply don't have. And even if they could investigate us, so to speak, they would be incapable of really understanding us because we exist on a different plane, and that's the way it is with God. You know, the only reason that we can know anything about God 
is because of his personal side that in his grace he reveals himself to us. In our study a few weeks ago, we looked at the Bible and we asked the question, what is the Bible? And we, one of the things we said about it was, this is God's self-revelation. That everything that we read about on the pages of Scripture are not just stories and historical accounts and law accounts and, and psalms. And it's not just that. But it's a revelation of who God is. In, in telling us and giving us this incredible gift, he's revealing himself to us. And you know, that really is a, uh, a, an example of God's grace. God doesn't owe it to us to tell us anything about him, to reveal anything about himself. God would have been absolutely, completely just and holy and righteous to have seen what Adam and Eve did in the garden and have taken no action at all and just let mankind for, from, from that point forward suffer the consequences of his sinfulness. God did not owe us anything. But God in his grace chose to reveal himself to us because there is no other way we could discover him. Grace and mercy, those are, those are terms that we use in church a lot. Grace is giving us what we do not deserve. We didn't deserve this, to know God personally, but he reveals himself to us. 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 2. Take out your Bible and turn there with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And this is what Paul has to say there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 9 and 10. He said, But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. Verse 10, For to us God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. All those things, we, they never, we never saw them. We never saw God. We never heard about him or, or thought about him. It's never even entered our heart to think about God on our own. That is true. The only reason we know anything is because God revealed them to us. That's a, that's a show, an illustration of God's grace. And it's an illustration of God's mercy that he takes the initiative to find us that he reaches down, he takes the first step so that we can find him. Listen, so that's, a, that's a part of God revealing himself to us. I mentioned that grace is God giving us what we do not deserve, and mercy is God withholding from us what we do deserve. I mentioned it a moment ago, what we deserve is eternity separated from God. What we deserve is absolutely nothing from him. But what we have, well, absolutely nothing except judgment. What he has given us instead is he has taken the initiative to help us find him, to enable us to find him. Jesus said, John chapter 6. I told you we're going to jump around a lot. I'll give you a second, flip back there. John chapter 6. Verse 44, this is Jesus speaking there in John chapter 6, verse 44. He said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him in. Have you ever stopped to think about that for a minute? If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you've repented of your sins and trusted in him, the only reason you ever came to that decision the only reason you ever even thought of God, thought of your, your standing before him, is simply because God took the initiative in his grace, in his mercy. And over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we were just there a moment ago. I'm going to ask you to flip back over there. Thinking, Man, Pastor, I wish you had told me that, and I kept my finger there. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we read verses 9 and 10, and jumped down to verse 14. 
And Paul goes on, he says, But a natural man doesn't accept the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. The only reason that you and I know anything about God, we can, the only reason we can know anything about God is because he's chosen to reveal himself to us and then he takes the initiative so that we can find him, we can know him in a personal way. And then the only response to that you know, we really recognize that and understand that about God, that that is, that is an example of His grace and an example of His mercy. And when we recognize that, the only proper response of mankind then is to worship Him, to praise Him, to absolutely just fall down before Him and say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We, we read over in Isaiah chapter 6, and we're not going to look at it, just a mention of that, that Isaiah there in chapter 6, he sees a, a, a vision of God in the throne room. And Isaiah's response when God reveals himself to Isaiah in that very real way, boy, Isaiah's response is just worship. He falls down before God. He recognizes who he is. He says, I'm a man of unclean lips. He accepts God's forgiveness. And then that powerful statement, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, he says to God, Here am I, send me. Use me, Lord. You are such an amazing God, now use me. And so we think about what God is like. We can't know everything about him, but we can know some things, enough about him. We can know personally about him because of his grace and because of his mercy. Our response to that is worship. The other thing I want us to talk about uh, this morning is that God is independent. That's one of the other things we can learn about God. And by the way, I don't know if I mentioned this already uh, this morning, but the things that we're talking about, about God, his characteristics and his, his essence, his nature, they kind of fall into two buckets. <clears throat> one of the buckets talks about the greatness of God. Now, those are the things we're talking about yet last week and this morning, the greatness of God, the fact that God exists, the fact that he is the creator, the fact that he is the, the sovereign king. Those gigantic things about God that, that are all inspiring those fall into the greatness of God. But then there's, there's some other characteristics that we're going to talk about about God that we're going to look at next week. And they show us the goodness of God. God is not just great and powerful and, and, and all-knowing and, and completely awe-inspiring. He's not just that. He's good. We sing that song on Sunday morning sometimes. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. And yeah, we, there's some, some characteristics of God when we think about what he's like that fall into that category of this is how we know God is good. And we're going to look at those next week. These we're looking at last week and today are God is great, the greatness of God. And one of the things about the greatness of God, the characteristics or essence is his independence. Have you ever stopped to think about this, that God doesn't actually need us? I'm going to let that just sink in for a minute. God doesn't actually need us. He doesn't need anything in creation. Sometimes you hear people say, they talk about, well, gosh, why did God create Adam and Eve? And you'll hear people say to that, well, he created them because he was lonely. He wanted somebody to, to hang out with. And boy, that sounds good, right? That, that really makes us feel good as people, that, that God created mankind because he was lonely. He, he needed fellowship. He, he, really, he really needed someone to hang out with. But listen, God didn't create humanity. He didn't create Adam and Eve because he was lonely or because he was missing something or there was some, kind of, some aspect of his, his fellowship that he was missing. Again, listen to the words of Jesus. This is in John 17. In John 17, we often call this the high priestly prayer. Jesus is praying there in John chapter 17. 
And we often call it the high priestly prayer because Jesus is filling the role of the high priest, interceding for the people, interceding with God for the people. And that's what he's doing here in John 17. But this is what he says, John 17, verse 5. He says, Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. You know, the very first words of Scripture in Genesis chapter 1, the first phrase says, in the beginning. But you know, when it talks about in the beginning, it's not talking about the beginning of God or the beginning of the Trinity. It's talking about the beginning of time and space and the universe and what we would recognize and what we know in all of nature, in the beginning of that. But, you know, there was, there was a lot that happened before in the beginning. God existed before in the beginning. And, he, and the whole Trinity existed. And what Jesus is saying there in John 17, he's pointing to that time before in the beginning. And he's saying back then, before the world was, we, you and me, Father, we had complete fellowship. See, God is completely happy, utterly fulfilled in himself. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need anything in creation. Back over in Acts chapter 17, we read past what Paul said about the, the Thessalonians and what he said about the Bereans. We get down to Acts chapter 17, verses 24 and 25. And it says there, the God who made the world. Now, this is Paul. Again, he's preaching on Mars Hill right outside of, um, right outside of Athens. And we got to go there a couple of years ago. Absolutely an amazing opportunity. But he says this to, to the Athenians. He said, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. See, that doesn't mean that God is distant and aloof. We just looked a moment ago that God is personally knowable. It doesn't mean he's, he's distant and he's aloof. It simply, it simply means that we should conclude from God's actions, not that he is fortunate to have us. I know we'd never say that, right? But there's some sense, I think, that some people will, will just give God that one hour on Sunday morning. And listen, I encourage you to go to church. Find a Bible-believing church and be in it. And be regular in it. We need the family of God. We need the people of God around us. And if you're here in the Aviano area, we would love for your church home to be here at Aviano Baptist. But if it's not, if, you, if the Lord's leading you to a different church here in Aviano, then you follow his leadership. Be there, get engaged, get involved in a Bible-believing church. But there are some people, sometimes, we will, will only give God that one hour on Sunday morning. And there's something in the back of our heads, again, these are words we'd never say, where we say, I gave God an hour on Sunday, what more does he want from me? Man, he should be happy. God should count himself as fortunate that I gave him that. I carved that much time out of my busy schedule for him. But we realize that God is completely fulfilled in and of himself. He's not lonely. He doesn't need us. He's utterly independent of us. We shouldn't conclude that he's fortunate to have us. We should conclude that we are fortunate that he even notices us, let alone has done anything else for us. God doesn't need anything. And we talk about God's independence. He doesn't. He is fulfilled completely in himself. Second aspect of that, though, he was not created. God always was. I mentioned that there, 
there was a lot that took place before in the beginning. God always was. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit, God existing in the Trinity. That's, a, that's another topic, boy, that we could spend weeks and weeks trying to unpack. How can one God reveal himself in three persons? And, and what does that really, what does that look like? And well, we could really try to unpack that and make our heads explode trying to do it. But before God created anything, he was. And he is not a created being. God always existed. Sometimes you will hear opponents of Christianity. And they'll kind of, you know, throw this out triumphantly like they've really caught us in something. And they'll say, you know what? As scientists look around, they, they've discovered that everything has a cause. Nothing in, in nature, nothing in, in this world just is. Everything has a cause, and that cause can be discovered. And they will say, well then, if everything that we see around us is created, who created God? And they'll kind of, you know, be all triumphant and self-congratulatory, pat themselves on the back for that. But God was not created. And as we saw last week, that God is the creator. He is outside of nature. That word supernatural, that means above nature. That's where God exists. The idea of everything must be created, everything must have a cause, that's within the context of nature. God is outside of that. He was not created. And listen, you and I can't really understand that. We can accept it as true, and we ought to, because it's what the Bible tells us. But we can't really fully, fully understand it. There's nothing in our existence that is like that. God always was. He is sometimes called the first cause. Everything else owes its, its, its existence to something but not God. Listen to what the psalmist says, Psalm 90. Psalm 90, verse 2, the psalmist said this, Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Everything in, in creation has owes their existence to something, but God is not in creation. He is the creator of creation. He owes his existence to nothing. And Paul said this in Romans chapter 11, verse 36. I know that was cheating a little bit because I flipped there as I was making that last point. But Romans 11, verse 36 Paul said this, For from him and through him and to him are all things. See, God was not created. God always has been. That's part of his independence. He's independent from nature. In our Bible reading plan, our community Bible reading plan there in the YouVersion Bible app, and I encourage you to get involved in that if you're not. If you want to get some more information about how to get connected to that, just shoot me a WhatsApp or a Facebook message or send me an email, pastoradavianobaptist.church. Um, but in our, in our Bible reading plan, we're, we're doing this Bible reading plan called Epic. And it's looking at the historical accounts of Scripture and what we learn about God. And we're, we're just finished up. We just finished up reading through Exodus. And, and in Exodus chapter 3, there's that account when God comes to Moses and he says to Moses listen I want you to go to the people of Israel first of all and tell them that I'm going to lead them out of Egypt and then I want you to go to Pharaoh and break the news to him and this is what Moses says in this initial conversation where God has charged him to do this this is what Moses says to God Starting in verse 13 of Exodus chapter 3. And then Moses said to God, Behold, I'm, so I'm going to go to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. So that's what God told him to do. So they say, Okay, that's what I'm going to do. And then Moses said, Okay, so now they may say to me, 
What is his name? What? And so then what should I tell them? And then I want you to look at verse 14, Exodus 3, verse 14. This is what God said Moses should tell them. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now, that's a significant name of God. I am. It's the Hebrew word Yahweh. Now, when in ancient Hebrew, there were no vowels. So it would have just been Y-H-W-H. We added vowels to it. You may see it sometimes in Scripture as Yahweh. You may see it sometimes, the Latinized version of that, Jehovah. And sometimes it's just translated, particularly in the Old Testament, as Lord, all caps. And it's that name, I am, Yahweh. And this is what it means. It means the self-existent one. I wanted to read the note, the footnote in, in my Bible uh, from Exodus 3.14. When, when God said that to Moses, I am who I am, and you tell them I am has sent you. This is what the footnote said. It said, related to the name of God, Yahweh, rendered Lord in all caps, which is derived from the verb Hayah, which means to be. You know, that really tells us something significant about God, his independence. He's not created. He is the self-existent one, the one who always was and always will be. God not only has life in and of himself, he is life in and of himself. He's not a created being. I am. I am self-existent, and I always have been. God is utterly independent, doesn't need us. He's not created like us. He always was. And there are a few implications. I want to wrap up our time here. This may take us a few minutes to wrap it up, but I want to wrap up our time with just thinking about some of the implications of this self-existence, this independence of God. First of all, God is not limited by space. We call that, you may have heard these terms, omnipresent and omniscient and omnipotent. And that's what omnipresent, that's what this means. God is not limited by space. You and I are limited by space. I'm here in my office at the church building, and I'm recording this lesson this morning, but I can only be right here, right now. I can only be in one place at one time, because we're limited by space. God is not limited by space. He's, in, he's independent of all of these human limitations that we have here on the earth. This is what the psalmist said, Psalm 139, if you haven't picked up on it already, boy, if you want to, you really want to get a sense sometimes of what God is like, boy, there is a lot in the Old Testament. And sometimes we ask the question, is the Old Testament useful? I mean, what we're, we're New Testament Christians now. Should we even care about the Old Testament? Oh my goodness, the things we learn about God in the Old Testament. But this is Psalm 139, verses 7 through 10. This is what the psalmist said. He said, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol in the grave, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay a hold of me. If I go to the highest point in this world or I go to the lowest depths, I go to the sea, no matter where I go, there you are. God is not limited by space. One of my assignments, I was a, a flight commander at Keesler Air Force Base in, in Biloxi, Mississippi. And one of the offices that was in my flight was the office that, that was responsible for the international students who came to Keesler for technical training. And we had a lot of students that came from Saudi Arabia, so a lot of Muslim students that came. And, 
And the guy who was in charge of that office was always getting called out on Friday nights and Saturday nights to bail these guys out of jail. And they were they would get drunk and they would get in fights and they would act disor drunk and disorderly. And so they were getting arrested. And and so he finally asked one of them, he said, now hold on a second. You guys are Muslim, right? And, and I thought that Muslims weren't allowed to touch alcohol. So why is it here? I'm bailing you out of jail for being drunk. And this is what the guy said to him. He said, you know, we're in an infidel nation here in the United States here for training. And so Allah cannot see us while we're in an infidel nation. You know, that's one of the key indications that sometimes people say, well, you know, Christians and, and Muslims, we all worship the same God by different names. No, we absolutely do not. The psalmist said that, listen, God is everywhere. That's what the Bible tells us is true. The, the, the Muslim's God, little g God, the Muslim's God is not everywhere. Allah cannot see them if they are in an infidel nation. They, with Christians and, and Muslims do not worship the same God by a different name. God is not limited by space. He's omnipresent. He's not limited by time. God, you, time is a concept that God created for us. It's, it's the concept of the earth he created for us revolving around the sun he created for us. So time is a concept that is limited to nature, limited to our existence. God is not limited by time. Listen to what John writes in the book of the Revelation. Let me just say this as you're turning there, a little pastoral pet peeve of mine. It is not revelations, plural. It's one revelation. It comes from the first sentence of the book, the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's one. It's one long movie with a lot of different scenes. It's the revelation. But listen to what, what John tells us. John, or Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. This is... God speaking. He said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Now, those are two Greek letters, the first and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. See, God's not limited by space. He's not limited by time. He is eternal. As we just talked about a few minutes ago, he has no beginning. He has no end. He's not bound by our concept of time. Do you ever get frustrated sometimes when God doesn't act on your timetable? And you say, God, I'm praying for this, and I really want you to, to, to act. And he doesn't act on your timetable? I know you will discover this if you haven't already, that his timing's always perfect. It may not be yours, but it's always perfect. But he's not bound by our concept of time. See, God sees and knows past and present and future as, as though they're all happening. They just all happened. That The big word we use for that, omniscient. He knows all things. He not only knows all things that you're doing right now, he knows every thought that you're having. Every intention of your heart, he knows them all. And not just for you, but for the other 7 billion people on this planet. And for every single person, whoever was and whoever will be, God is not limited by time. He exists, period, apart from that. Another implication of his independence is he is holy and omnipotent. That's another one of those big omni words, right? Omnipresent, he's everywhere. Omniscient, he knows all things, past, present, and future. Omnipotent, we looked at his his characteristic and quality of him being the creator, the sovereign king of the universe. And because he is set apart from, he's in control of all things. He is omnipotent, all-powerful. That's what that word means. And as we looked at it, one, another implication of his independence, he can never be fully captured by human concepts. And as and I think we looked at this last week. That shouldn't put us off. That shouldn't make us question God. If we could understand everything about God, that should make us question God. 
He is so much bigger than us. He's so much more powerful than us, so much smarter than us. He can never be fully captured by human concepts. And there will always be a difference between us and God. And listen, I think one of one of the last implications of God's independence, God's um, omnipresence and his omnipotence and his omniscience, the fact that he doesn't need us or anything else in creation. He's not a created being. He always was. He is all-powerful. I think one of, the, one of the final implications I want to just mention is that we should view the miraculous as not only possible, but probable. Listen, if there was a Bible that didn't contain any miracles, and there are some people that say, you know, I, I, you know, the stories of Jesus, those are good and inspiring in the Gospels, but I don't believe the miracles. I, I just, I just can't get my head around those. But, but listen, miracles are things that happen outside of what we normally experience. But if God is all those things that we just talked about these last two weeks, if God is all of those things the self-existent one, the all-powerful one, the all-knowing one, we should expect miracles. If there was a Bible that contained nothing miraculous, boy, I should, I should not be inclined to believe that. What kind of God is that? If God is all those things that the Bible reveals to us, I, I expect I would see some miraculous stuff now and again. Listen, we take a step back and we start to think about what do we believe about God? What is God like? These things that fall into the category of the greatness of God. I hope that this has been a, an instructive two weeks of study for you. To take a look at some of those things that we believe about the greatness of God and say, I can go to Scripture and you may want to go back if you didn't write all those verses down. May I don't know. I can go to Scripture. Go go back and write them all down. That's what I was going to say. But I can go to Scripture and I can point out when I talk about God's omniscience that He knows all things. I can go to Revelation chapter one verse eight and say this is why He's the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. This is why He knows all things because He's apart from time. And so you you can go back to Scripture and say I know not only what I believe about the greatness of God, but I know why I believe it. Okay, so now next week, we're going to jump into some more characteristics of God, but we're going to look at the characteristics of His goodness. God is not only great and gigantic and awe-inspiring, but He's a good, good Father. And we're going to look at some of those characteristics next week. I'm glad you joined me today. I hope this has been a blessing to you. I hope you have a wonderful week. I want to close our time in a word of prayer. Before I do that, though, I just want to give this invitation to you. To say, if you have questions, first of all, to email them to me. I mentioned my email address earlier, but I'll give it to you again. Pastor at avianobaptist.church. Hit me on Facebook. Hit on Facebook Messenger. Hit me up on WhatsApp if you have questions. If you want to talk to anyone about your relationship with Christ. Is maybe you, you know that the Holy Spirit is talking to you and speaking to your heart, that you have never repented of sins and trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And if you want to talk to somebody about that, those same methods, you can reach out to me and I will be glad to sit down with you and open up the Word of God, open the Scriptures, and see and introduce you to this one who will forgive your sins and give you eternal life. I'm glad you joined me today. Let's close our time in a word of prayer. Father, thank you once again for the amazing gift of your word. Thank you for taking the step to reveal yourself to us. In your grace, you showed yourself to us. An act of your mercy, you enable us to understand you. Just, a, just some, just a little bit, but enough. And Father, I pray as we, as we consider throughout the days of this week, the things that we talked about here this morning, the greatness, the characteristics of you that show your greatness, and what all that means to us, Father, I pray that it would just drive in us a renewed sense of awe and reverence and, yes, fear of the Lord. Father, we, we are so grateful for who you are. You are so amazing, and yet you notice us. 
and yet you care about us, and yet you love us. Lord, thank you for being all of those things. Thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. And I pray your blessing on everyone who's watching this lesson and your blessing on those that aren't able to make it. And bless us this week, Lord. Use us for your kingdom and for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Have a great day. Have a great week.